Hello, mystery and thriller fans. My name is Jess, and this is Cam Cat Unwrapped. You've been listening to Dead Air, which is an IBPA Benjamin Franklin award winning audiobook and a 2020 Indies Book of the Year award winner. I have Michael Bradley here, who's the author of this book. And Michael, I'm so excited that you're here to chat with us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Jess. Yeah, of course. So excited to get to chat with you a little bit. Uh, But before we get into Dead Air, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I know I'm dying to hear about it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I uh, I live in Delaware with my wife and our two spoiled dogs. and it, it, anybody who has listened to Dead Air knows that it's that they're the, the protagonist is a radio DJ, which I actually did for eight or nine years of my life before I moved off to a career that actually would pay me money. Um, so, so there, there's definitely some background, um, true to life background in the book. Uh, but uh, this is my third book. Um, I have uh, two previous ones that came out, and um, I've got another one actually coming. Uh, later this year as well. So, uh, called none without sin, but, um, yeah, I've just, I've been writing for about, uh, 15 years. Um, I did a lot of creative writing when I was in high school, um, which I found a couple copies of what I'd written in high school a couple of years ago, stashed in a box somewhere and it was terrible. So I've grown quite a bit since then. Um, I've grown significantly with my writing capabilities, uh, since high school, but, uh, you know, so I've been, you know, writing off and on for a good, I don't know, about, uh, 40 years or so. Wow. So. Wow. Well, you know, if you ever decide to get your high school stories published, you know where to go. <laughs> That's very cool. Trust me. I, nobody wants to read my high school stories. <laughs> <laughs> Take my word for it. Um, it was, it actually, it's funny cause I, um, I had the opportunity a few years ago to actually visit my old high school and talk to some of the creative writing students that were there. And one of the things that I told, told them was that, you know, I, yeah, I wrote in high school. It was really bad writing. Um, and I had this tendency then to put all of my friends in the stories as characters. Oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, this is, this is going to sound really creepy. And I'm sure that at this point, you know, I'll be probably have a, uh, some kind of restraining order put on me. But uh, in 10th grade, I had this crush on this girl and she ended up in a bunch of my stories as the love interest for the character that was based on me. So, yeah. But I'm sure she has no idea. And I'm sure that you were able to pull that off really seamlessly. So, <laughs> yeah, she, uh, yeah. Considering that I named all their first names were the same. Yeah, she probably didn't know. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, that's a little bit different then, but we're going to, we're yeah. going to, those stories are never going to see the light of day anyway, as you've said. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're probably in the clear there. <laughs> um, so just based on some research that I've done about you, which I'm sure sounds equally as creepy as you writing stories about people, <laughs> um, you are pretty well traveled as well. And I know that you based Dead Air in Philadelphia and that you'd spent some time in Philadelphia as well. Uh, what made you choose Philly as the setting for Dead Air? So uh, Philly's kind of, it's just the area that I'm most familiar with. I grew up in New Jersey, um, just across from Philadelphia, spent a lot of time as a teenager and a young young adult over in Philadelphia, you know, visiting, you know, some of the sites and that sort of thing. And I, I like to in my in my books, I like to actually set things in real locations um, to kind of draw the um, the reader in a little bit more. One of the things that I've some of the comments that I've heard in the past from my books was that, oh yeah, you know, I read it and I knew exactly where this scene took place. I've been to that place. I've seen. I know where exactly where you're talking about. Um, you know, even in the 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 scenes in Dead Air that take place in New Jersey are all based on real locations. Um, you know, I changed business names and that sort of thing to avoid the whole you know, lawyer lawsuit sort of thing. But uh, I usually like to try to get the geography as close to reality as I possibly can to give that the reader a really good sense, you know, particularly with those that have been to the places of, you know, you know, what's going on and that familiarity that will come with having the real locations in the book. I didn't know exactly how long you'd spent in Philadelphia, but that's cool that you feel so familiar with that area. 
Um, I'm reading another one of our books right now that takes place in my hometown. And I know that that really sets the scene for me. So that's very cool. Um, so Dead Air is your third thriller novel. What's your connection to the genre of thriller? Uh, it just happens to be the genre that I like to read the most. Um, I was, uh, the advice that I've been given numerous times at various writing conferences and from other writers was that you should write the, write in the genre that you are, that you, that you like to read. Um, so, you know, for me, writing, writing romance would be out of the question. Um, but, but writing thrillers and mysteries, that's what I read the most. So I'm most familiar with the, the techniques that are involved with the genre. Um, I'm most familiar with the, you know, with how to write that sort of thing because I've been reading it all my life. Uh, so that's just kind of what drew me to it. I mean, science fiction is, is nice. Um, I've tried in the past to write a little bit of science fiction. I just have, it's the whole world building thing that usually gets in my way, having to create this whole world and these you know, elaborate science fiction type things. Um, it's, it's for me, it's much more comfortable to write about the real world. Um, so that's another reason that I kind of stayed in the, the mystery and suspense in the thriller genre, because they're usually, they usually are more uh, modern day uh, happening in this, this decade, this era, era, that sort of thing versus trying to go into the future or in the past or something like that. Sure. That makes sense. Write what you know, which kind of very seamlessly leads into my next question. Uh, Caitlin Ash, the character of Caitlin Ash in your book, she's also a radio DJ, which you'd said that you have quite a bit of experience with. In what way did your personal life inform that character? Or do you feel like she's based on you in any way? She, Caitlin Ash is based on a number of people that I knew in broadcasting. Yes, there's there's probably a little bit of Caitlin in there, uh, a little bit of me in Caitlin. Um, probably more, she's probably more from my perspective of what I really wanted to be when I was in, when I was in broadcasting, you know, I really wanted to work in the big market like Philadelphia or New York. And really that was kind of a dream that just never came to fruition. So kind of like parents do with their kids, I'm living vicariously through Caitlin. Um, but there are several people, uh, you know, there, I didn't base her on one particular person. There's traits from a variety of people that I've known in broadcasting that have uh, kind of made up Caitlin and, you know, the final version of what Caitlin ended up being. Yeah, that makes sense. I can see that drawing a lot of reference from all different areas of your life and, and different people that you've encountered. I love that. I think that's so cool. So over and over again, the band REO Speedwagon is referenced. <laughs> what is yep. your connection to them? REO Speedwagon uh, was actually the, the song Can't Fight This Feeling was the was one of the two inspirations for the book. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so I grew up in the era when that song was a big hit and didn't think anything of it. Um, but uh, a few years ago, I remember uh, I, it came on the radio um, and I remember listening to it. And as I was driving, it, it's I was driving the car and I remember listening to the lyrics, maybe listening to them a little differently than I used to. And I suddenly realized that that song is kind of about a stalker. It's, it's not, it, it, you know, when you listen to the lyrics, it just, it just gets kind of creepier as you go along. Like it's, uh, you know, it's, um, there's a line in there where it's like, you know, I, 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 you're a candle in the window on a cold, dark winter night. So it's like, okay, so this person, the singer is watching somebody through a window in the middle of the night um, you know, there's, I'm following every, you know, it seems everywhere I'm wandering, I'm following you girl. So, okay, now you're following somebody. Um, and then there's a line that's, um, where the, the singer says, you know, I'll come crashing through your door. So now we've just gone from stalking now to breaking and entering. Um, so for me, for me, that song just, it completely changed. And it was like, okay, this song is about a stalker, not about somebody who's, you know, deeply in love with someone. This is just, you know, creepy. Um, and that kind of percolated in the back of my head for a while when I was trying to come up with um, you know, an idea for the next for my next book. And, and that was, you know, it just slowly said, hey, you know, that song, Stalker, um, I could use the song as part of this. And, you know, and then it, and then everything else just kind of you start to do that. What if sort of questions and everything just kind of fell into place from there. 
So that's the big connection. You know, it was just, I just, I, I probably have just ruined that song for everybody that grew up in the eighties. But um, yeah, it, it, I think I think that song is completely about a stalker. <laughs> I think that's so great. Uh, and I love that you chose to write a lot of the story from the perspective of the stalker here. And honestly, from multiple perspectives, you have the perspective of the detective, Caitlin, in a third person narration style, her perspective as well. What made you choose to write from multiple perspectives and what was that like for you? So I was I, I was always planning to write the book with uh with at least two perspectives and it was it would be um caitlin's and uh, rodney who's the detective um that had always been the plan um so when i got done the first draft uh, first of all it was short uh, huge, huge amount of words i'm like how did i end up you know i got the whole story then i'm like how did i end up this short um but then as i was reading through it i was like you know there are things in here there's parts of this story that i want to tell that I didn't feel like I could tell from Caitlin's perspective or Rodney's perspective, but having the perspective of the, of the, um, the, the antagonist in there and just a, you know, a, a kind of stream of consciousness sort of uh, mechanism in, in certain chapters seemed to work because that gave me the ability to kind of add some pieces into the, the picture that would sound odd or be strange coming from Caitlin. And coming from Rodney, especially since Rodney didn't know anything. He didn't know the background of, you know, Caitlin's background or anything like that. So that it gave me the opportunity to, with that third point of view to give um, information to the reader that I couldn't give any, any, any other way. So that was why I kind of, I went back in the second draft and added the, the antagonist's perspective and um, absolutely loved it when it was done. It was really hard to write, though, uh, particularly there's a couple scenes that because, um, you know, the antagonist gets a little more crazy as the uh, the book goes on. And there were a couple scenes where I had to get really deep into the, the antagonist's head. I'm really trying to avoid the pronouns here because I don't want to give anything away. Um, um, but I had to get really deep into, into the sensations and the feelings and. Um, there is one scene in particular that I had to walk away from the keyboard for about a week after I wrote it because it was just so draining um, to write. It, it, there was a scene where I guess you could say the antagonist kind of goes over the edge finally. Um, and when I got done writing that, I was exhausted. Yeah, it was very draining because I had to get really deep into a dark place in order to write it from from the antagonist perspective. Yeah, I understand that. And I'm actually so glad you brought that up because I thought one of the strongest choices that you made and one of the things that I thought was what made the story really special and impactful was that you chose to write from the stalker's perspective. I thought that was really, really cool and interesting and not something I'd seen done before. So I really love that you had made that choice. And uh, you had mentioned that Initially, your plan was just to write from Caitlin and Rodney's perspective, but I'm not really sure what your background is with detectives, and maybe this is research that you had done for your other novels as well, so maybe some of your prior research had informed this character, but one of the things I really found interesting was this struggle that he was facing between balancing being a good cop and being a good father. So what kind of things did you have to use in order to inform his character? One of the things that I, I try to avoid, I, I don't particularly like to write what are called police procedurals, where it gets really deep into the police police procedure. I prefer if I have a police officer in the in a story, I usually try to avoid getting into too much detail about procedural because there's always going to be somebody that'll go, "Oh, that's wrong. Oh, that's not right," you know, because um, you know I could research all day long and. I would probably still get something wrong. So I usually try to avoid getting into the procedure and focus more on the character. Um, but for, for Rodney, um, it, it was, it, it really was just all made up. Um, there wasn't anything in particular that influenced that for me that influenced him, particularly around his struggle between being a police officer and being a, a father. That was really just something that, that came out of my head. And I'm like, you know, Hey, you know, I need, I need him to have something, um, that he's struggling with, and you know that's that was that's part of the character development. Is you just don't 
you just don't create a, a detective who is just, you know, at perfect. And he's just, you know, there's nothing wrong with him. Um, and, and there are so many, there's so many of those drunk detectives or alcoholic detectives out there in literature. And I wanted to, I wanted to stay away from that. I wanted to get a little different. Um, and so when I was thinking about it, I'm like, oh, what would be, what would be the one thing that would really, really be a, a, a an issue for a police officer that would really be a challenge, really place them in an awkward position. And that would be if, if they had to do something with one of their own family. Um, and that was, that was kind of what, what brought that to the surface was, you know, Hey, what, what, what could happen that would, you know, almost break him um, to the point where he is, you know, his whole life falls apart. Um, I, I just, I wanted to get, I wanted to steer clear of some of the, the, uh, the uh, cliches that have fallen into detective fiction. And, and I just felt like this was a, this was a nice change uh, when I was starting to do the character development for him. Sure. Well, you obviously have a knack for writing flawed characters. What fascinates you about that? What is the process of writing these flawed characters like for you? Um, trying to, for the process for me, um, I kind of try to be realistic because I mean, let's face it, everybody's flawed everybody has a flaw somewhere and you know when you read fiction where there's a character that does that's not flawed that's uh you know perfectly got their life in order and everything is great it's hard to believe um so for me i was i always like to create a flaw in in my characters even if it's a small one um and so for me it was like i said you know i sit down and i'm starting to work on the, the character um, the first thing I usually focus on when I'm developing the characters is what they look like, um, which is, which is a lot of internet searching. You know, I have a file with my character sketches and there's always a picture attached of either it's either a celebrity or somebody that I found online, a picture I found online. I'm like, okay, this is what my character is going to look like. That's exactly what I want to look like. And I put, put it in the, in this file so that I can always reference it. And then I go back and I, you know, I start to look at, you know, where were they born? Where were they? You know, were they educated? You know, what is their job? Where do they live? What's their favorite um, favorite drink? What's their favorite food? Um, I just kind of go through. I, it's almost like interviewing the character. You know, it's almost like I'm interviewing the character. You know, what do, what do you like to do on a Friday afternoon? You know, if you go to a diner, what do you have? What do you order? Um, and that way I get to know the character uh, before I even start writing the story. So, and then I'll start throwing those little t- t- tidbits into the the story as I'm writing it. And it kind of brings that character to life. Um, there's a huge difference between saying, uh, it, it is, in my opinion, there's a huge difference between saying the my character picked up a glass of soda versus the character picked up a Pepsi. Because that is a detail that's very specific to that character and it defines that character. Um, the same with alcoholic beverages and food. You know, I went to the diner and I ordered food. I, I went to the diner, I, I ordered a chicken Caesar salad with this um, and so forth. Um, That kind of adds a little bit to the character for me. Absolutely. Yeah. As you said, it really, for me, the reader, for the audience, it really brings those characters to life. So I think it's very cool that you focus so much on those details. Um, So as far as writing characters and, and just in general, creating your stories, what, I was trying to find a, a segue, but I don't really know <laughs> how to how to segue this. So I might just ask you flat out. Uh, so you have your new book that's coming out with us. Uh, you'd mentioned earlier, None Without Sin. What can you tell us about that? Uh, so None Without Sin um, is uh, actually takes place in Delaware, um, and it it uh, revolves. A, yeah, well, you know, it's it's I research is easy. I just drive down the street. You know. Um, so, um, so it is a story about, um, a small town newspaper journalist named Brian Wilder and a, um, faithless minister named Candace, um, uh, oh my God, I can't remember my character's own last name, uh, Candace Miller. (laughs) Um, and in this small town that they live in, people start to die and what they, they're discovering is that whoever is killing these people is using a medieval or a Victorian era um, religious ritual as the calling card. And the, the ritual is, uh, it was a, 
in the Victorian era, there was this ritual that was called sin eating. Um, and the, the idea at back then was that the, um, when the rich were dying on their deathbed, the, um, their family would call the, the town's sin eater who would come in. Um, they put a loaf of bread on the dying person's chest. Um, and that's supposed to absorb the rich person's sin. And then the sin eater would eat the bread. Um, and take the, the idea is that he would take on the sin of the rich person. So the rich person could go to heaven. Um, and usually, usually the sin eater is like the poorest of the poor, you know, I mean, you have to be, if you're going to sell your soul like that. Um, but the symbolism from that ends up showing up in none without sin. Um, and, and it, it came from, it actually did come from an article that I read. I had read an article about sin eating. Uh, just it was like there was this hey this this here's this historical thing and I read it, um, and I read it I guess ten years ago and just kind of bookmarked it and stuck it you know you know copy the copy it into some notes and just kept it kept it there for for a long time because I was like this is going to be an idea someday, um, I just knew it when I read it um, and then slowly but surely that that idea just started to percolate in the back of my mind um, until eventually it became none without sin. Wow. Well, I have so many questions about that, but I think I'm going to save it for when I bring you back on for our interview okay. about None Without Sin. That sounds so amazing. I'm so excited to read it. Before I let you go, I do have one more question for you. Um, what are you reading right now? I am I am actually reading uh, an older book right now. Um, uh, it's uh, by a writer named uh, M.K. Wren. And it's part of her Conan Flag series. It's a mystery series, and it's actually the uh, the series that originally got me into into mysteries to start with. So I'm rereading that series just to um, just to kind of re revisit a familiar face, you could say. Um, uh, it's book seven of an eight of the eight book series. Um, it, you know, it started. It was written in like the, the original book was the first book was written in like the 1970s, and I had found it as a teenager fell in love with just the idea of mysteries and suspense through that book. Um, so I'm just rereading the series right now. And, and I have, I'm also reading, uh, I've, I've got two going on. I'm reading that one. It's called wake up, uh, wake up darling Corey. And then I'm reading um, ghosts of Thornwall. I'm listening to ghosts of Thornwall place right now as well. So that's a, another cam cat book, but um, so I'm somewhere I'm on the wall back and forth me. between the two of them. Yeah. Oh, right behind, oh, yeah, it's right behind your head. It looks like, yep. yep. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Okay. Very cool. I want to ask everybody that I think. So I really love hearing, especially since you said that's the genre that you're most interested in and that's the one you feel like you're always going to write about. I'm always curious what our authors are reading because I assume that it informs your decision to write more thrillers. So very, very yeah. cool. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me and for sharing all of this stuff. And if you guys like what you hear, Make sure you check out our audiobook. You can find them anywhere audiobooks are sold. Dead Air was a pretty great audiobook to listen to, in my very biased personal opinion. <laughs> yeah, Ra Rachel Fulginetti was a narrator, and she did a fantastic job of capturing. It, and I was very nervous about uh, because you never know how the narrator is going to interpret the characters' voices. And I, when I listened to the first chapter and heard how she captured. Um, Caitlin's voice. I was just giddy like a schoolgirl. Like, oh my gosh, that's, that's exactly how I envisioned her. Um, and then when she, and then when we got into some of the scenes with the um, the antagonist, it was like, oh, that's so good. Um, so yeah, she was a fantastic narrator. Yeah, she really did such a wonderful job. That was her voice was one of the things that I felt like was so capturing and her telling of the story. Thank you so much. And before I let you go, how can we find you? Do you have social media accounts? What's the best way to find what you're up to next? So I am on the online at uh, www.mbradleyonline.com. Um, and I'm also on Twitter and Instagram at, uh, at uh, mjbradley88 is where you can find me. So just search for that and you'll find me on Twitter and Instagram. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Jess. I appreciate you having me on. And to the listeners at home, you can find Dead Air in audiobook, ebook, and print formats on our website, camcatbooks.com. 
You can also find CamCat Unwrapped on all major podcast distribution sites or watch us on YouTube at CamCat Publishing. And make sure you follow us on social media at CamCat Books. Thanks so much for tuning in. My name is Jess, and I'll see you all next time here on CamCat Unwrapped.